we are here with the Giacomo Micheli. He's a great guy. We go some way back. Uh, already being part of uh, the organization of young executives uh, and uh, assisted to other events uh, originally planned in Lausanne. Just a few words uh, first about the organization, then about the school, and then finally about uh, the presentation today. Uh, the organization, so we are the young executives here in Geneva, so we are an organization based uh, from the uh, Chamber of Commerce, the Italian Chamber of Commerce in Switzerland. We organize uh, events on these kind of topics, so events that could be very beneficial for all of us to acquire some additional knowledge. Events that are in the mouth of everyone, because everybody speaks about them, everybody uh, read about them, but then in concrete, you know, you don't, unless you really read books about it, you don't have the possibility to hear uh, such an experts, you know, to, to speak about the topic and in one hour maybe give you enough information to uh, to make your mind, you know, read about something so important. So, about the school, uh, Geneva Business School, we're really glad to have uh, founded this partnership. There are already some students actually from the school that are here among us today. We will do more and more events here. It's a really a great school. We have some former employees of my company, MSC, that have studied here. So there are some brochures here in the, in the front row. So if you are interested also about what the school does and the events that they, they, they develop here, feel free uh, to take advantage of, uh, of these informative pamphlets. Now about uh, the presentation. So uh, Giacomo has studied uh, uh, theoretical physics at the University of uh, Pisa one of the toughest uh, university and very well-known university of Italy. Then he moved uh, to Milan, where again he continued his studies, to uh, prior his move back to Lausanne, where uh, he started uh, as a, a, a research scientist for the Ecole of uh, Polytechnique Federal de Lausanne. And, uh, and now what is here today is uh, the most important thing, really, because what is here today for us is to show us how uh, the uh, business of artificial intelligence uh, can really change the way we see our future from two main perspectives. The first one is uh, the business one, so to understand how the uh, business of artificial intelligence will impact the business that we live today or how can we modify our ideas uh, and our business ideas uh, with the help of uh, obviously the artificial intelligence and from a consumer perspective as well how can this uh, technology can modify the way in which uh, we as a consumer we spend our daily routine our life so without any further ado uh, please help me welcome Giacomo <laughs> I'm going to give a kind of uh, introduction in terms of an approach as a physicist. So basically, I'm going to show you some problems that we solve in physics using statistics and computers. That basically for marketing is being translated in the name artificial intelligence. So if you ask me like what artificial intelligence is, I can give you just a ready definition. Artificial intelligence, uh, to me, is an oxymoron, and uh, if the more artificial it is, the less intelligent. So, <clears throat> um, this talk basically was born by an idea that I got because I have uh, some of my friends, actually, that keep asking questions. Questions like, <clears throat> what is artificial intelligence? Is machine learning and artificial intelligence the same? And what about deep learning? The machine that will be uh, more intelligent than man, and uh, they will take over, they will gonna kill us, and uh, so on and so forth. Right? So I hope that after this talk today, at least you get an idea. I'm not gonna give, I think, any answer to these questions because I think it's gonna be very clear to yourself what is gonna be this and how it can be used. Okay. Um, the idea of uh, starting studying in the physics perspective is like one of the big questions is what can we do with artificial intelligence? How can we use it to solve which kind of problems? Now, the idea came actually to give an answer to this question from this book. I was at the library and I found this old book 
and I read the title, and it was what is life. And, uh, and I read the name of the author, and uh, it, for the, for the non-physicist here, I can tell you that this name is a very big name. Okay, so this is the same guy of the, get the cat, he's alive, he's dead. Uh, he's the father of quantum mechanics. So I took this picture, and I sent to my friends, who is also a physicist, and other, my colleague at the, at, the, at the Institute of Theoretical Physics, and I said, sic passit gloria mundi. So basically, I was thinking, also Schrödinger got crazy in his life. Because generally, when scientists, they start talking about what is life, what is God, maybe it exists, I can show that it doesn't, and so on and so forth, and they start talking about metaphysics, science is finished. But actually, I said, okay, I take the book and I give a chance, because the name is too important. I cannot believe. Actually, in this book, already in the, in the beginning, um, Schrodinger, he was uh, very humble, and he said, I don't want to uh, disappoint any of my colleague working in biology, because I know that it's a very important topic, and I'm not an expert. Uh, but I want to talk about life from a phys physics perspective. And uh, when he was reading, he was asking himself, every time we are told that we are made by atoms, everybody in his life asks himself, why atoms are so small? And he was saying himself, this is the wrong question. We should ask ourselves why we are so big. So, and uh, the answer to this question was given by another prominent physicist, still alive actually, probably one of the, the brilliant mind, uh, the, the bright mind that we have nowadays, uh, one of the most important physicists. And he was saying that actually, we are so big because more is different. So, so if you see this, this is a simulation that I was leading, and if you see these atoms, actually this is a compound that you have in your laptop and in your phone. It's the material they do, um, uh, memories, and what is so called also solid state memory, right? So this is solid state uh, disk. So basically these materials are phase change materials, and they, phase, they change phases very fast, so of the order of picosecond. And, uh, the, pro the physical properties of the amorphous and the crystalline phase is so different that basically you can do zero and one. So basically you can use this to, uh, to have a bit. <coughs> now, the idea is that the single atom in this huge system it has no idea that it is participating to a huge, something huge that can, be, can contribute to, to give a revolution to informatics, right? So you're just following very simple rules, the basic rule of fundamental law of quantum physics. So he's an atom, he knows they attract other atoms, two atoms they cannot be so overimposed because the Pauli principles, that's it. Nothing else. But if you change the temperature of this, something happens, and basically they change phases. And uh, this is a different system than the single atom. This phenomenon in physics is called imagined phenomena. So, and uh, I'm pretty sure that all of you is very well aware about this. So now try to think that if you substitute atoms with birds or atoms with fish, so what you get actually is school of fish and the birds that they are drawing all this beautiful uh, picture in the sky. So they are moving together, and the single fish has no idea that it's a part of a big system. This is exactly an emergent phenomenon, an emergent structure. So the, the practical definition of this is that actually there is no leader. I know that some one of you is saying, oh, there is someone who is the leader, saying to all the other what to do, there is no leader. Right? And this is an emergent phenomenon. Just I want to give like a, a simple definition of what an emergent phenomena is, is that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Basically, this huge system, EPA, is completely different than the, the single rule that the fish follows. The fish, they, it has been proved, they just follow the simple rule of keep constant the distance. That's it. Right. So just to show you that basically you can also keep changing instead of using fish and birds, you can use humans. 
and I show you that there is no leader with this little leaf. So this is called the motion, right? So and this has been shown that the people when they react this way, they follow exactly the same equations of atoms in a gas. And uh, so you see there is a, an order phenomenon like waves, but the wave is not the most important. In this video you cannot see it. There are other phenomena like vortex of people. These are very, very impressive. And there is no leader, it just uh, it comes uh, by himself. Now, if you consider less violent <laughs> uh, video of this, imagine always a huge amount of people and uh, you give them the power to buy and to sell. So you got the financial market. The financial market is also an American. So now we can basically use, by the way, the simulation of atoms I use deep learning neural network to simulate the phase transition because it's, I mean, if you increase the number of systems solving the fundamental equation of quantum physics, it's very difficult. I mean, it's pretty much impossible. So then you need to change perspective. Now we can use all these techniques of statistics. Now you understand that we need a lot of data, a lot of data, and we need computers. And we use technique of statistics, which means artificial intelligence. So we can study this kind of system. So you can find any parallelism with your business, maybe because you can use also customers. They form an imagined phenomenon. So basically we can study the, the behavior of this huge system by studying the correlation of all the interaction with the single parts. And we can do it using computer. Now, how intelligent a machine has to be to study this? This is a hundred or maybe two hundred billion dollar question. Not even Alan Turing was able to give a definition of intelligence. So basically, in physics, there is uh, what we call operative definition. So for each quantity, whatever, it doesn't matter, even the most simple, we give a unique and universal recipe that we can use this, for instance, length. Right? We all agree that there is a bar which is in Paris or near Paris, and there are two lines between this bar of uh, platinum iridium, right? And this distance is called meter. So now, if you want to use this to measure the distance of something, you can measure the length of something, which is a property of a body. Now, there is no operative definition for intelligence. Try to think. I bet if I ask you, what is intelligence? I bet that each of us give a different definition. And all the definitions are correct, but none of them is unique. So basically, there is another perspective now, which was the perspective of a professor from MIT, which is Professor Minsky, which is, I think, more angle. Right? He says, intelligence, like consciousness, justice, right, wrong, all this are suitcase word. So it's a word that contains in itself lots of definitions, all of them correct. So this is very important for artificial intelligence because every time that you have a device that you say is intelligent, actually it's not. It's just performing a specific task, right? This could be an answer to the question, machine will be more intelligent than us. We are not even able to define what intelligence is. There are humans, they, they surprise us every day. And kids. Right. So then I stop here with the philosophical discussion and I give you a definition of intelligence using the word intelligence. Which is perfect, but at least we understand each other. Okay? This guy, by the way, is the director of the Alan Turing Center in, in, uh, in Cambridge. And he said, okay, simply enough, and we stop here. Artificial intelligence is the ability of a machine to perform tasks generally associated with intelligent beings. So intelligent beings is not all human, so it can be also animals. Okay? So which means that a machine needs a brain, needs an interface to communicate with us, and a body. These to avoid future confusion, for confusion are the key technology of artificial intelligence. 
machine learning, natural language processing, and robotics. And artificial intelligence is on top of all of this. Just to anticipate, deep learning is a technique of machine learning and is belonging to this part. And since deep learning is a huge field, it is considered kind of apart from machine learning. But it's within this category. Okay, now imagine that we have uh, our baby, right? So we have a machine with a brain, the voice, and the body. Now we need to teach it to do task. Now there are two different ways of teaching it, like in, uh, because we try to imitate nature, right? One way of teaching is called supervised learning. So basically you teach the machine giving example, right? Like, like in this case you show the number one and you say this is number one. You show the number two and you say this is the number two. In the future you're going to pose different questions and the machine will reply because you already learned. There is another way that we call unsupervised learning. However, I would say that sometimes when you give a task to a kid that he has no idea what to do, like you give the Lego and you say, now put them all together in an ordered way. And maybe you give to a kid and he organizes all the same color. Another kid basically put like the, the little one with the little one, the big one with the big one. None of them is right, none of them is wrong. And uh, actually, sometimes when they are wrong, it's also beautiful because we human, when we are wrong, it's most of the time art. Like uh, the, the Pisa Tower is a network, but it's beautiful. <laughs> but uh, at the same time, if a machine does a mistake, it's going to be a huge disaster. So basically, it's better to work a bit with uh, supervised learning. So I'm going to show also some unsupervised learning, by the way. Now, what do you need? to have a system like this. To have a system like this, basically we need the data, we need computers, and sophisticated theory beyond of statistics. And you need a physicist that is taking care of all of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's just to say that it's, there is no magic, it's just science. Okay? And uh, to show you how, let's go. Into, into a little example. In, uh, in, on April 15, 1912, the Titanic sank after colliding an ice, uh, an iceberg. The problem is that there was like uh, about 1,500 dead and over 2,000 passengers. And the problem was because there were not enough uh, lifeboats on board. Now, the probability to die, actually, of the people there, it was quite random, right? But at the same time, some of them, there higher probability to survive. For instance, women, children, and upper class, right? Now, I wrote an algorithm that teach the machine how to solve this problem. So imagine I download the, the, the list of the passengers of the Titanic, and I use 70% of the list with a label. Okay, I want to highlight this example. It's going to be all kind of machine learning algorithm that you have around, right? So you're going to use, or you're going to hear always the same words. So you have features, you have label, right? So basically, once you have a table like this that describes each uh, passenger, like name, sex, age, siblings, uh, parents, children, so on and so forth, and then you give this guy time. The other one survived. And so you use 70% of the list to teach the machine. So you use this, you feed the machine, and you give the answer. So the machine is figuring out what's the, the algorithm, the logic behind, right? After that, you take 30% of the list and you try to guess. Actually, the result is quite surprising, so I use an algorithm, I got 85% probability uh, the machine was right, and only 50 was wrong, which is actually okay, because the logic is not rigorous, right, so sometimes there is an error. Now something more important, the machine does not only give you the prediction, the machine is telling you what's the most important feature you were using. Now, I guess that if I ask you what's the most important feature in the case of the Titanic is? 
sex. Right? No. It's the title. So basically, if you were a doctor or a sir, you had more chance to survive than a woman. And uh, it's nice because it really reveals some something from the past. And, uh, by the way, I discovered that on the Titanic there was a doctor who was a woman, only one. <laughs> um, again, this is not magic, right? I show you the algorithm behind. <laughs> the algorithm behind is called decision tree. Of course, we, we always go to nature and ask for solutions, right? And uh, basically, the decision tree is a learning um, algorithm that infer the rules from the data. Now, for the Italians in the audience, you were doing this when you were at the elementary school. But I guess also the foreigners that are doing the same. This is called flu chart. So basically, the flu chart is just posing question, like binary question. <coughs> That you answer yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. Right? So, in the case of the Titanic, the first question you would ask, I bet, is were you male or female? The first. And then you go uh, through the branch, right? Until you get the answer. Okay, these in the technicalities, they are called branch, by the way, and it's the leaves that gives the answer with the probability. Just to say that it's no magic, every time you do this, you have a subgroup of individuals, and the machine is performing a measure which was introduced by a physicist, Turing uh, actually. He uh, was one of the fathers of international theory, who was uh, Claude Shannon, and this is called entropy. So basically, he was using the concept of entropy of Boltzmann and using it for information. And uh, at each step, the machine is me measuring the purity of a subgroup measuring the, 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 the entropy of the information, right? Now, there are two problems with these algorithms, right? These algorithms can be done by all of you, but if you increase the number of features, for each feature, you have a binary question, right? So here you can start. It was this, the guy Cecilia, right? <coughs> and now, of course, it's already a stupid question because you get lost, you say, no, so what? Finished. You can pose a different question. You can say it was a set, which actually is a good question, right? And uh, and then you can go on. So basically, you can start with the many, many, many different questions, and you can have many, many, many flip chart. Now, for us, it's very tough. For the machine, it's very easy. The machine is trying all of them, right? And uh, just measuring the difference takes the best first. Second, where do we stop? So imagine I pose you the question, uh, if I give you an ending, uh, a guy and ask you, like a person, and I ask you, this guy is Italian, can you tell me if he participated in the First World War or not? So the first question you would ask is, is a man or a woman? Right? Then you can also stop here, maybe you can ask the age. But imagine you start a flu chart like this, is a man, yes. He's from Tuscany, yes. He likes Chianti, yes. He participated in the war, yes. No, you start again. He's a man, yes. He's from Tuscany, yes. He likes Chianti, no, then no. He didn't participate. Mm -hmm. That's wrong. This is called overfitting. So basically, the machine uh, learned by heart what you were showing to the machine. So basically, the overfitting is when you have your kids home and you try to teach them mathematics, multiplication, and there are two kinds of kids. The one that they understand the method of doing the multiplication, and the other one who learns by art all the multiplication that you show to him for the homework, and the day after at the exam, he can fail, because he was overfitting. He was learning by heart this multiplication only. He didn't understand the method. This is a common problem of machine learning. So one way to avoid this problem with this is democracy. Instead of asking only one tree, we ask too many trees. So we have the population, we take some part of the populations and we give to all different trees. All of them, they construct all the possible fruit chart and they give an answer at the end. And at the end, you, 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 you can measure a score and you decide which fruit chart is the best for prediction. 
you can overfit also with random forest, but this is a different story. It's just to, to tell you that we can do all this. By the way, these arguments that seems like very easy, they're used by Google, Facebook, Amazon, and so on and so forth. This is called like, like algorithm of classification. With this algorithm, random forest, just to tell you on a net, uh, in the United States, the company of retailers, basically, they want to know when there is a destructive moment in your life, like when you get married, uh, it's a destructive moment, when you, <laughs> when, you, uh, when, you, when you change a job, and when your wife, she's pregnant. Especially when your wife, she's pregnant. So they want to jump into your life and advertise a lot of product for babies. And basically, they are a guy, and uh, this guy, using this algorithm, recognized like 25 items. That when these items, they were bought, they were like you buy these items in a specific order, the probability that the woman she's pregnant it's very high. Not only, it could guess also the due date very precisely, like plus minus few days. And uh, one day. <coughs> Like a father of a teenager went to the CEO of this company asking and complaining, blaming the guy because the company was sending, sending advertisement of creeps and uh, baby clothes to the teenager's girl. And uh, the CEO was like uh, very sorry and uh, basically invited him to dinner. And the week after, the CEO was so sorry that he called him back and the guy said, Actually, it's me who has to say sorry, because my daughter, she's pregnant. <laughs> and that this happened for real, and there was a big scandal in the United States because of privacy and things like this. But this is not magic. So our body follows the patent, right? And you can detect very easily patterns if you have data. It's not magic. So, so far I was telling you only about tables, numbers, what about pictures? i tell you with this. <clears throat> this is a comment saying, like, the boss is going to the computer scientist. It's not sexist. I found the <coughs> picture. This is not because it's the boss. It's, a, it's natural. It's natural. Yeah. So, um, he asked, um, do you have to build an app that whenever you take a picture, the app is telling you if you are in a park, natural park. The girl says, OK, no problem. I connect to the GPS, and I can give you if I'm a, I can tell you if I'm in a park. Then the guy says, okay, but you have also to recognize if there is a bird in the, in the picture. And the guy said, okay, give me a, a research team and a few years, because this is a very difficult problem. So actually, if you show this picture to a three years old kid, it will immediately say, ah, look, a bird. So this is called, in psychology, Polanyi paradox. Basically, we do things that we cannot explain. How can you explain the way you recognize a bird in this picture? How can you explain to someone coming from the universe, whatever, how you ride a bicycle? There is no way of doing it. We just do it. And uh, we do things that we cannot explain. This means that we cannot write algorithms to tell the machine the way to do. So the idea was basically, OK, I don't tell anything to the machine. I don't know how to do it. Somehow I built an algorithm, which is a black box. I feed with data. And I tell the machine that this is the correct answer. And if the machine gives a different answer, somehow I go back and I modify all the parameters of the machine. This is called back propagation that maybe you heard sometimes, okay? Basically, the problem that was solved only in 2004 was this. So for you, it's like very easy. Say, ah, number one, number two, eight, one, it's very easy. No problem, right? But for the machine, it is very difficult. So this is one of the, the tests that now they're still using to test if, if a machine is uh, well programmed. So now, think, the error, actually, they did the last test, uh, August 2018, the error of the biggest machine was less than 0.01%. So the machine was right. I mean, this is a database, huge database of handwritten written in the United States. 
But I mean, this is very difficult, and now I'm challenging you. For you, it's very easy. I look at this now. <laughs> I guess you spend a few seconds, or still, maybe you are thinking, if this is a dog, how <laughs> old muffin? Okay, now the machine is much faster than you. The machine can recognize this in a fraction of a second. Actually, in 2015, for, for some specific task, the machine is much better than man. Actually, this is the error that we do, and this is the error of the machine. So now the machine is much better than us in recognizing objects. Uh, what's behind this? No magic again. <coughs> this is called the neural network, and uh, it, it is inspired by nature, right? So how it works, I show the video this way at the top because I think the video is a bit long. So a neural network is a collection of neurons that was uh, borrowed by nature, right? Like a real neural network, collection of neurons, and they are connected in nature with axons, and here basically coefficients. <laughs> so we call this neural network. Now, depending on the problem that you are using, you have to use a different kind of archi architecture of your neural network. This is called perceptron, and it's just that all the, neuro all the neurons that you have in your system are fully connected with all the others. And uh, this is a, a single uh, perceptron. You give the input, which are the pixels of the, of, the, of the picture, and you get the output. However, sometimes you need a different architecture to reach a, a, a higher abstract level of reasoning and you use what is called multi-layer perceptron. So basically you have the layer and you get the input and you get the output. So in this case the neutrons are not fully connected with all the others. They're just connected one layer with the other layer with the other layer. But now imagine you give a picture to the machine. Now, the machine is considering the picture, but the, the pixel, but actually, it's also important what is around. Right? In this case, you use what in mathematics is called convolution. So basically, you have a function, then you do the convolution of your signal, and actually, you have this, which are, uh, we are called convolutional neural network. Basically, these are the ones that use Facebook, whatever, they recognize uh, one layer, the nodes, another layer, the eyes, the other layer, the ears, and so on and so forth, and then they're collected and they compare the differences, right? So the other one that's going to come, they're not very important, I think they're not very used nowadays, they're called spiking neural network. So you introduce also the timing, and the neuron not only fires, but also accumulates energy and then fires. And these are the ones used to simulate, I think, the brain of mice. But uh, these are very expensive, expensive computations. These are not only used for Facebook to recognize your face. <coughs> Actually, in China, they have a huge project and they are using it because the, the biggest cause of death in China is uh, the cancer to lack. And basically, they are doing tomography, I think, and, uh, and basically the, the doctor is looking at the microscope if he's able to detect some cancer cells. However, if you think, it is very difficult for two reasons. First, in China, there are too many, and there are not so many doctors. Like, a doctor takes a while to, to take and check the, the picture, right? And at the same time, sometimes it can happen that people, they don't get uh, their own, um, I mean, the, 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 the doctor, they cannot care of all of them, right? Because that's too much time. First, second, the doctor doing it for one or a day, at the end of the day, is very tired. Sometimes he doesn't see very well anymore, right? So the machine is not tired. Actually, they developed a convolution of neural network to detect uh, cancer cells. And they realized that together, the doctor with a the man, they can do much better. Sometimes they do also not only very fast, but sometimes they can detect to, uh, like cancer cells in the very early stage, which is very important, right? Now, um, the problem is that um, to, to train, this is a technical word, a machine takes a long time. And 
to make a machine recognize something, you have to show this something. Huge amounts of times. Like if you want that a machine recognize a cat, you have to show huge amounts of picture of a cat. However, imagine you go to the city with a baby, three years old always, and he's never seen a bicycle in his life. And he sees this. And he asks you, what is that? And you say, that's a bicycle. Right after, round the corner, he sees this. A bicycle on top of a balcony. And he says, that's a bicycle. Then he sees this, which is a very weird bicycle, but still a bicycle. And he recognizes it. Then he sees this. He can also recognize a bicycle which is broken. Then he says this, a fit. Because he has still not the concept of folding a bicycle. But now he has. So basically for each of this picture, he was updating uh, the, the way he was learning and updating the concept of bicycle. Now basically with this four picture, the baby will recognize all the bicycle in the universe. So if you give four pictures plus the one before to a machine, you <coughs> recognize nothing. This is called the problem of small data. How can we solve this <coughs> with what is called <coughs> Bayesian statistics? So <coughs> this is exactly the way humans, we, uh, we, uh, we have our reason, right? So we make hypothesis, we have a prior belief, and then with data, we update our knowledge and we get a posterior belief. Now, this is very important, and I will show you why. Imagine, imagine you have a coin, I show you really the coin, but it doesn't matter. You have a coin and I ask you what's the probability if I flip a coin to get head. I guess you would say, all of you, 50%. But if I flip this coin, maybe you are not so convinced anymore. Okay, but maybe what you say, you say, I believe that based on my experience, the probability is 50%. But since the, the, the coin is uh, a bit weird, I give a chance to believe that it's also a bit less and a bit more. This is, is a distribution and is called Bayesian statistics. So the difference between these statistics and the usual statistic that you fix the probability to fix percent like a spike here, right? Is that the other one is called frequentist statistics. Now what you do, you give, you start flip the coin. Okay, I build the coin and the computer is fake. I generate random number with a probability of 80%, right? So then I already tell you that the probability to be head is 80%. So you start flipping the coin, two times, ten times, twenty, fifty, hundred, and the machine is reading the data and is learning. So basically, this is what we call that. So the machine realized that actually the probability is not 50%, it's 80%. And while it was evolving, the width of the curve, it was shrinking. This is very important, because this width is called uncertainty. Right? And in our life, we take decision under uncertainty. You want to see an example? Imagine you want to classify this. These are two moon, let's say half moon, right? And you, you are around here, you're going to say this is blue. If you are around here, you say this is red. Now I use two different machine learning algorithms. One is a random forest that I show you. And I classify the dot in the, in the space. Another one I use deep learning. <coughs> you see that the prediction is completely different. Now, if you want to make a nice painting for your wall, <coughs> they're both fantastic, you can use both of them, right? <coughs> Imagine that now the blue is the blue is break and the red is accelerate. This happened for real, a few months ago. So basically one of the autonomous vehicle, I don't say the name, but it's very famous, <laughs> <laughs> that used deep learning neural network confused the white side of a trailer which was perpendicular to the, to the street with the bright sky. So it classified as bright sky. If there is a bright sky in front of you, you accelerate. And there was a big crash. Actually, the uncertainty was, the prediction was 75% and the uncertainty plus minus 40. So in that case, you probably say, okay, maybe better if I break. 
Basically, this is an open project. They are working on it at the Oxford University and trying to develop on top of, of neural network Bayesian statistics in order to have also the uncertainty on top of this. Now, I finished here and I just uh, give you a list of three projects I have done just to give you what you can do also except physics. So I tried to classify the, because uh, the machine, so far I was talking only about numbers, right? But the machine actually can read also text. And this is very important because especially in business, the, the amount of data which are no numbers, it's more than 80%. It's uh, always speech, text, and, and audio, and what, right? And in this project, I was classifying the Spocky author identification. They're all Spocky authors, and the, this is the feature now. So you give the text, and you give who is the author. In this case, Edna and Paul, right? Okay, yeah. I wanted to do it live, but I couldn't, I cannot, because I got a, I got a precision of the machine on 76%, and I'm pretty sure that if I show you now, I'm in the 24%. So then it doesn't work. <laughs> but uh, I, can, I can show you. That uh, it was. It's nice because if you enter in a library, you have 1,000 books. You don't have to read all of them. 70% is fair enough. But if you have to show in public with just uh, two sentences, it's going to be always 24%. Dr. Murphy, right? <laughs> so another project actually was finance. I was always using natural language processing, and I was reading the news and New York Times. And basically, I was extracting negative and positive words. Then I was going to Google Trends, which are data with a stamp, timestamp. And basically I was saying I just implemented a strategy, which was if people are looking for negative words, sell. If people are looking for positive words, buy. So I predicted the 2008 financial crisis, but that's just the machine did it itself. It was, um, I was not saying anything. Of course, you cannot use to trade everyday life. Last project that uh, actually I'm working on, how to build a portfolio, right? So here I was using Bayesian statistics. <laughs> so basically it's exactly what you have in finance. You have to take decision under uncertainty. In finance you don't have average returns and volatility which are constant, they depend on time. And uh, basically what happened is that this is not a static distribution, but it's evolving, right? So in this case, I was using a Bayesian statistic to quantify the uncertainty and I build a portfolio. And uh, I could avoid the crash of two or three, two months ago. Um, but actually, I didn't put money. But... <laughs> <laughs> now, the last question is, will machine will replace men? The answer to me is that in the future, artificial intelligence will replace managers. But manager who use artificial intelligence will replace those who don't. Actually, if you want to change, if you want that things remain the way they are, you have to change everything, right? Thank you for your attention.